Good morning to all of you gathered here on the 13th Development Policy Research uh, Month celebration. The theme is very appropriate, Tamang Regulation para sa patuloy na padawan. Allow me to greet first over the President of the PIDS, Dr. Gilbert Yato. I'm very privileged to be joined in this panel by my fellow schoolmates, all coming from Sunbeda. Um, aside from studying from UP, at the Attorney Mary Anzalaki studied in the Sunbeda College of the I understand. My, my good friend, Ibeda also, serving Ibeda Mayor in Quezon City, uh, Gary De Guzman, the head of the Business Process and Licensing Office. And yours truly, the the Deputy Administrator for Planning of the Maritime Industry Authority. I've been listening intently on the presentation of the two speakers, paying special attention to what our uh, President of PID has mentioned, emphasizing on the, the need for regulatory reform so that we'll be able to sustain our growth and economic development. And we see there a slide which he did not uh, actually focus on. I mean, the slide that tells us that uh, Whenever there is a setback in terms of uh, of uh, our uh, governance, uh, poor governance has muted the impact you know, of uh, of uh, regulatory reforms and challenges. And uh, what I can say in the last five years, at least in the maritime industry authority and in the big picture, we've been experiencing uh, considerable growth, not only in economy but also in the in the maritime sector. But uh, on the bigger scale, they say that. Uh, the, the projection is that by 2050, the Philippines would be one of the uh, 16, one will be the 16th largest economy in the world, the fifth in uh, Asia, and the uh, first in South Asia. Southeast Asia. That's not according to me. That's according to the projections made by the Hong Kong and Shanghai Bank, and even the uh, and even the Goldman Sachs estimate that by the year 2050, the Philippines will be the 14th largest economy. And we'll be able to sustain this with the right regulation. We say less regulation, more governance. I think uh, that will bring us to where we, should, we ought to be with 2050. So let's go to the first slide. This is the, the, the brief background where we are. Um, the Maritime Industry Authority, the first slide. Excuse me, sorry. For those hearing Marina for the first time, we're not the, the restaurant somewhere in Ross Boulevard or you know, somewhere in Queso City. It is an organization dealing primarily with the shipping sector. And uh, it's an attached agency of the Department of Transportation and Communications, the DOTC, whose task is to accelerate the integrated development of the maritime industry in the country. Our vision is to become the premier maritime administration in Southeast Asia, propelling the Philippine Maritime Agency to global competitiveness by the year 2016 and beyond. And our mission is to effectively administer an integrated... This, this uh, clicker moves automatically. <laughs> effectively administer an integrated and sustainable I think it's because in the interest of time, it's 12.05 already, so... Anyway, um, I don't know how you'll be able to do it manually. So, just follow me in my presentation. I don't reference the slide because it's moving automatically. It was created in the year 1974. That's the Maritime Industry Authority. By virtue of Presidential Degree Number 474. Providing for the reorganization of the maritime, uh, reorganization maritime functions in the Philippines and creating the Maritime Industry Authority. And in the year 1985, EO1011 was issued. That's nine years after, or 11 years after the creation of the Marina, that abolished the Board of Transportation and transferred its quasi judicial functions pertaining to the maritime transport to Marina. What this executive order, which was issued by President Marcos during that time, uh, the implication of which is they created an LTFRB within Marina. So if you ask me, what is the function of Marina? We're actually the LTO and the LTFRB of the maritime transport sector. 
We are in charge of issuing licenses to all the seafarers and the crew on board vessels. And we are also in charge of regulating the franchises, issuing the franchises, canceling and revoking the franchise of those uh, ship owners or ship companies trading in the Philippines and those Philippine flag vessels trading overseas. In addition to that, another function was, was uh, actually transferred to Marina. And that is the function that used to be the Philippine Coast Guard. And that is the maritime safety function. Under Executive Order Number 125 and 125A, which was issued by President Cory Aquino during the time wherein she was enjoying both the executive and legislative uh, power, RA 125 and 125A actually transferred to Marina all the functions being performed by the Philippine Coast Guard relating to the issuance of certificates, licenses, or documents necessary or step of their two, as well as the issuance of the certificates of competency to seafarers, issuance of licenses to qualified seafarers, and harbor bay and river pilots. So, Executive Order Number 125, as shown in this uh, diagram in the year 1987, transferred the function of the Maritime Training Council, which is under the Department of Labor and Employment, and so far as the issuance of certificates of competency to seafarers, and therefore authorizing Marina to enforce laws, rules, and regulations governing water transportation and merchant marine by deputation the Philippine Coast Guard and other law enforcement agencies. Now, what happened after that in terms of the maritime regulation? In the year, in the year 2004, Republic Act 9295 was actually passed by Congress that provided for the liberalization and the regulation of the domestic shipping industry. Unlike the, the land sector or the land transport sector, as early as 2004, we've, been, we've deregulated the maritime transport sector, meaning to say the fees are deregulated, we, we don't impose fees, and uh, in order to be able to attract competition, we actually uh, liberalize the entry of uh, players in the domestic shipping industry, and uh, we also, during that time, um, they regulated the fixing of the fees of the passengers. So it's actually the, the market or the competition that's actually dictating the, the the price or the fare that the passenger should pay whenever he boards a particular vessel. So this particular slide, which is very important, summarizes all the functions of Marina. There are four sectors under it. One is the shipbuilding and ship repair sector. And according to recent reports, the Philippines is the number four shipbuilding country in the world, number four in the world. And uh, that's because of the presence of the large of the large shipyards in the Philippines, namely Chunishi in Bonamban, Cebu. We have Hanji, somewhere in Subic, and we have Keppel in Batangas, and all other medium-sized and small-sized firms that caters not only to foreign investors or foreign uh, ship owners, but also to our domestic sector. The other sector which is under the, the marina is the domestic, domestic, rather, domestic shipping sector. We're regulating more than 10,000 merchant marine vessels, excluding, of course, the fishing vessels. They're also under our regulation, but in terms of operation, they're being managed or uh, they're under the, the Bureau of Fisheries and Aquatic Resources. But in so far as registration of vessels are concerned, and so far as the requirement for the crew for the fishing vessels are concerned, that's also under the marina. The other sector there is the overseas shipping sector. We have uh, around 118 Philippine registered vessels trading in international waters. So these are the Philippine flag vessels uh, doing business internationally. And uh, the other sector there is the maritime and power sector. This is the sector where we can say that this government and the sitting president and the DOTC under Secretary Abaya and uh, prior to that, Secretary Marlojas actually exercised the, what we call re regulatory reform by putting under one single administration the regulatory functions involving seafarers. I would like to emphasize on this one, especially on the, the maritime and power sector. For a seafarer to be able to finish his course he has to go to 
a, a college or university offering Bachelor of Science in Marine Transportation or Bachelor of Science in Marine Engineering. And that's under the regulatory power of CHED. After passing the, the course, then you have to go to the Philippine, the Professional Regulation Commission, or PRC, for you to be able to take your examination to become a licensed officer. If you will not be able to pass the licensure examination for officers, then you can actually work on board the vessel as a rating, so that it is better. Then you have to go to the TESTA to be able to qualify as ratings to work on board uh, vessels, whether trading domestic or internationally, or to work as support a service, probably in a cruise ship, then you have to go to TESTA. After that, you have to have your certificate issued by the what we call Maritime Training Council, which is under the Department of Naval and Employment, for you to be able to work on board. And just look at this scenario. It's only will be that one seafarer trying to work on board vessel has to go to more than five agencies, including, of course, the National Telecommunication Commission, if your function is relating to a radio operator or a JMDSS operator. So what happened is that in the year 2012, the president issued executive order number 75, a very crucial landmark executive order that puts together all the functions relating to maritime sector involving seafarers under one department, and that is the Department of Transportation and Communications, particularly under the Maritime Industry Authority. So, ito ho ang pinaka matibay na halimbawa na ang kinakailangan para maging competitive tayo ay eh, ilagay mo yung regulasyon hanggat maaari sa isang ahensya na sa dapat ang nakakalam. And what would be the, what has been the fundamental argument for it to be placed under one agency? We are the only country in the world for the past several years exercising the regulatory functions over seafarers na nasa labor department ko yung regulation. Pagpiloto ka, you're under ka, and that's under the OPC. Kung driver ka, you have to get your license under LTO, and that's a transport issue. Kung sino pa? Piloto, uh, okay, dapat in the, in the transport sector. Kung sa rail ka, you're under the OPC. Di ba? Pero pagdating sa water transport, you're under the Department of Labor. So, ang ginawa ko ni Presidente, in the line of your function, and that is in accordance with the existing convention of the International Maritime Organization, particularly in the implementation of one global regulation called Standards of Training, Certification, and Watchkeeping for seafarers. And because of that, nagkaroon ho ng pinaka-latest na batas. Ito ang pinaka-huling regulasyon na issue under this administration. It's Republic Act 10635. Meaning to say, the law which has been issued, or the executive order, which was which was issued in the year 2012 by President Aquino, was actually transformed into a permanent legislation by virtue of Republic Act 1065. Because in the past, similar executive orders were issued with President Ramos saying, from labor, you, 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 you should transfer it to the Department of Transportation. But when President Era assumed function, he returned back the, the, the function back to the Labor Department. So, ang nangyayari, palipat-lipat yung regulasyon. So, nung nagkaroon ng batas, which is really necessary, I think it will stay permanently under the Department of Transportation and Communications, Marina for that matter, so that we'll be able to cater to the interests of our Filipino seafarers. Now, if you'll ask me, how many seafarers are there working on board international vessels? At any given time, POEA says more than 400,000 seafarers. More than 400,000 seafarers. How many seafarers are holders of the Siemens book? Or the seafarers are get the division record book? 800,000. We need to say 400,000 on board. Others are actually working in the domestic league. And others are waiting to actually take their time to work pagpababo ng papalitan nila. And in terms of uh, foreign exchange remittances, how much is the remittance of the Filipino seafarers? Five billion dollars used to be 4.3, then 4.8. So on the average, it's five billion dollars annually in terms of foreign exchange remittance. Well, ang ganyang kalaki sa isang sector lang. Of course, that base is bigger in terms of number, but in terms of the remittance, when one solid block of professionals, pinakamalaki po ang 
seafarers, and the regulatory response of the government to be able to protect and promote the interests of Filipino seafarers is to pass a legislation, the fastest ever under this administration. Pinasaho ng June, naging pakasuyan, Pebrero. Hindi ho tumawid na isang taon pagkatapos ho ipasa yung batas. Sapagkat kinakailangan ho natin gawin not only to be able to become competitive, pero ang naging issue ho yan, under the European Maritime Safety Agency audit, there's a probability that the Filipino seafarers will no longer be allowed to work on board European flag vessels because the poor process of certification, of education and training. Because there are a lot of seafarers before who were accused to be getting their diploma somewhere in Kalao and Recto. And because of the computerization process, because of the process of the you know, IT-enabled process, they're able to really track down which schools are performing, which training centers are actually performing, and that resulted to a reduction of number of schools offering these courses. Nabawasan na ho yung mga eskwelahan na nagbibigay ho ng diploma pero hindi naman talaga nakakapagturo. Nabawasan na rin ho ang mga training centers na nagbibigay ng training certificate pero hindi naman talaga nagbibigay ng appropriate and what we call yung tama home training. So what we can uh, assure you right now is that the process that we introduce in the Maritime Industry Authority, particularly on the sector of the seafarers, is to be able to produce globally competitive and qualified Filipino seafarers. And we are the number one choice in the world. We are actually occupying the number one slot. 25% of the global supply of seafarers are actually coming from the Philippines. And we do not want to lose that position. So we continue on a daily basis to be able to respond to the challenges involving the, the seafarers. Now, that's on the, on the maritime manpower. I'll go back to the domestic shipping sector. I was inspired by the presentation of uh, Attorney Salada, wherein he met, she mentioned that uh, they imposed several uh, uh, yung, yung pag, pag age, no? yung age, age uh, limit for vessels, uh, for buses. Baka itanong niyo sa barco ko ba, uh, Atty. Conti, meron pa kayong limitasyon uh, sa pag-approve uh, ng mga barco. Eh, luma na yung mga barco sa domestic sector. May lumulubog, may mga kinakalawang, ano ba regulation. Now, the sector in the domestic shipping wherein an age limit has been imposed is on the tanker sa tanker uh, vessels. So, if more than 15 years old, then you cannot register. There's no age limit for cargo and passenger and all others. But for as long as you're a class, we need to say you pass a classification society, an, an audit firm for vessels and for company, saying that you are actually, you have an efficient safety management system, then you can still qualify for as long as the vessels are well maintained. So that's the issue. Talaga bang na-maintain yung mga parko. So, at least in the domestic sector, we've issued several policies to ensure that uh, we are on the way for continuing modernization of our domestic fleet. And uh, we, are, we are actually adopting the vessel categorization, the, the categorization areas, navigational areas for, uh, for vessels, meaning to say, we are following what Japan did, color code and yung magiging biyahe, yung mga ruta. So, doon pa lang sa ruta na yun, kung alam mo na yung yung waves, yung wind, and all other factors will not allow a particular size of a vessel to navigate on that area, hindi ka na magka-qualify. Similar to land transport, yung tricycle, hindi pwede sa mga sa highway or sa tollway. So dito ho, meron kaming project, the what we call categorization of navigational areas. So that, pagtingin pa lang ng Coast Guard, out of line ka na, uhulihin ka na, dahil dapat yung bangka, hindi pwede dyan. There's a particular size for a particular kind of uh, domestic uh, water so that we'll be able to protect and promote the safety of our passengers. Again, on the, on the domestic uh, shipping sector, we are trying to pursue what is stated in the law, the progressive restriction of second-hand vessels. Pinipigilan na po natin uh, ang pag-import ng mga segunda manong barco. Para ho lalo natin mapagyaman at mapagtibay ang ating mga domestic shipbuilders. So what we're saying is that we restrict, there's a progressive, it's not an outright, but progressive restriction, may schedule do, nasusip din ng gobyerno upang sa ganon, 
Pagdating ng araw, hindi ka na magiging import ng second hand. Pero ipapagawa mo na yan dito sa mga domestic uh, shipbuilding companies natin. In the meantime, hindi mo siya outright ma-impose kasi two years para isang taon o dalawang taon para mag-build ng isang barko. But you need to address the capacity now or the demand. So, pag na-macho natin yan based on the demand and the supply available, eventually we'll be able to modernize our domestic fleet. And uh, we, we, have, we, have, we are looking into other scheme or incentives to be able to entice our, uh, our uh, domestic ship owners to be able to invest and modernize their fleet. Meron ho kami proyekto na hanggat maaari ho yung mga wooden hulls, eh, hindi na ho i-re-rehistro yan. Hindi na ho i-re-rehistro pag lumagpas ng limang taon. Pero kung ito naman ay mapapatunayang pwede pa o ibig sabihin po ay seaworthy, they have to undergo a rigid inspection bago po ma-rehistro yung mga wooden hulls. And yung wooden hulls po, wooden hull vessels, pero ng particular area kung saan sila pwedeng magbiyahe. The other functions are being referred to in the maritime safety and environmental regulation has been clearly delineated in the law, creating or uh, the law that actually institutionalizes institutionalize this function to the Philippine Coast Guard. So the rest of the functions, so, wala nang overlapping yung marina sa Coast Guard. So pagdating mo sa enforcement ng maritime regulations, Coast Guard na po ang ating pinag-uusapan dyan. But in order to ensure the seaworthiness of the vessels, as well as the issuance of all the statutory certificates referring to safety for the vessel as well as the documents for the food that's still with Marina. And one of the regulatory reports we introduced for the registration of vessels used to be 60 days off bago makapag-registro ng barko, including importation permit and etc. Ngayon, we can do it in 9 days. Pero hindi ko tinalo si Gary kasi ni-reduce niya into 8 days sa kanila. But that's a dramatic decrease in the number of days of processing and we really need that because ano nangyayari ho, nabili na yung barko, may cost of money involved na, but just because matagal yung regulation, alos dalawang tatlong bang hindi pa siya magagamit. So we try to address, uh, uh, address that uh, regulatory burden by reducing the processing time as well as, as, well as the adoption of a post-approval system. Meaning to say, there are certain requirements that you can actually submit after processing the initial approval. So we did that so that we'll be able to encourage the more more players to actually get involved in the in the domestic sector. I think this is a press briefing, and uh, the more details of uh, the presentation will be discussed on September 17th. I think there's going to be a question and answer portion after this. Uh, all I can say is that under the administration of our uh, DOP Secretary Abaya, uh, Administrator Max Maya, we've been trying to really address all the issues relating to, to shipping as well as the maritime sector, the latest of which is the approval of the co-loading app. Maybe you would like to be enlightened on that issue. Simply lang ito, we allow foreign vessels to do multiple port calls in the Philippines. Meaning to say, dati ho, pag yung foreign vessel papasok sa Pilipinas, ang port of, ent ang, ang, ang port of entry niya is Manila, then you have to unload all the cargoes then transfer it to smaller bottoms sa domestic. Ngayon ho, they can do multiple port calls. Meaning to say, these are uh, Philippine-bound uh, 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 cargoes, so hindi na ho ibababa para nang ibiyahin sa Cebu, Davao, or in Iulit. Pwede, pwede nyo na rin yung barko na yun. Ano yung ano implication po niyan? Mas mababa po yung cost of shipment or transshipment. At mag, ang epekto po, hindi tataas yung presyo ng mga bilihin dahil po dito sa amendment to the cabotage law. Ibig sabihin po ng cabotage, ang pwede lang mong barko na mag-trade sa domestic water ay barko pag-aari ng mga Pilipino. Ngayon, pag inalaw mo yung foreign vessel to do business in the domestic water, that's a violation of the cabotage. But the exception is, if you're actually handling cargoes on board these foreign vessels that can do multiple port calls, pwede po yan under the co-loading act, which was recently passed by Congress and approved by the President. And this is one of the innovations that will really enhance and promote the efficiency of shipment of cargoes in the Philippines, especially those bound for our uh, foreign, foreign uh, countries. So I would like to end with this uh, 
for this remark. And uh, again, thank you, the, the President of ADS, uh, Dr. Gilbert Nanto, uh, my, my fellow panelists here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sheila. Thank you for the assistance. And sa inyo pong lahat, maraming salamat po.